One of the things that's really unique about working in the Solicitor General's office is that you, in that position, represent the entire United States federal government. And sometimes various parts of the federal government have very different perspectives on the same legal issue. Now, in private practice, if you have two clients with diametrically opposed views, you call it a conflict and you can't represent either of them. In the federal government, the Solicitor General represents both. You have to figure out a way to reach a compromise between those competing views. You know, that process of working together uh, internally within the executive branch to forge sometimes a compromise position, sometimes going one way or the other, uh, was a real challenge, um, but also one of the real rewarding aspects of the job. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, the state's claim to back rent here is truly remarkable. When these dams were built back in the but day, before the application of ICWA, two things would be crystal clear. The Section 13 of the Securities Act and its three-year time limit plainly provide This case involves the constitutionality of two congressional districts in North So obviously on the Supreme Court right now, you have a range of different approaches among the justices. And you have some, and obviously Justice Scalia really exemplified this, who were very focused on the text and the text alone. Then you have other justices, and Justice Breyer is probably uh, the best example. They start with the text, but they have a list of five or six different contextual features that they're also uh, willing to look at. And you need to make an argument that appeals to both of them. You know, the Supreme Court is not going to let a lawyer get away with generalities or just hitting a broad theme. I mean, they're going to have lots of very specific questions and they're going to want very specific answers. I think back at my time at the law school and, you know, probably the one professor who stands out above all the others was Phil Arita. Um, he was, you know, I was fortunate to have him in my first year contracts class. Uh, you know, he, used, he was old school Socratic method, but he was so clear in getting the students to articulate the point, refining it, asking the hard questions. I didn't care what he was teaching. I wanted to take as many classes of his as I could. Sometimes in the law you are wrestling with very big issues, but to be able to address even those very big issues with a real clear focus I think it's something that really distinguishes the great professors and the great advocates uh, from the very good professors and the very good advocates. Uh, should the uh, Supreme Court televise oral arguments? I honestly don't see a particularly compelling argument why the public shouldn't get to see what the proceedings televised. And I think if they did, they'd have a very high opinion of the Supreme Court of the United yeah. States. Well, I appreciate that. You're a hell of a lawyer. The least intuitive career move I made was to go work on Capitol Hill for a couple of years after I had already started on my appellate practice route. It was the most counterintuitive move I made and absolutely the best career move I made because a couple of years later when they were looking to staff a new executive branch administration, they had lots of lawyers who were top of their class at great schools. Uh, they had some people who had a very political background and they had a really tiny stack of resumes that had the academic background and a little bit of political experience in terms of working in the Senate or working on a campaign. And everybody wanted the resumes in the middle because there weren't very many of them. So don't be afraid to take a career move that some of your classmates think is a little crazy.